everybody. My name is Meg, and I find it kind of humorous that I know we, you know, there's a lot of groups that are going on right now, but I do find it kind of humorous that I'm doing a uh, seminar on burnout, and it's in the middle of lunchtime. So where you guys should be hanging out, doing stuff to not burn out, instead let's come and learn. But such is such. I find it kind of humorous. How many of you guys came to the, first, the group that was in this room the last time, the Healing from Trauma? A lot of you did, okay. So some of the stuff that I'm gonna be talking about is stuff that you already received in that group too. She was pretty good, she did a really good job on explaining the um, brain functions. And I do a lot of the same. I, like, I really enjoy talking about the brain and what happens in the brain. So some of this might be um, familiar from that class. Um, so my name is Meg and I am doing this class on secondary trauma, burnout, one of the reasons I like to do this is because it's something that I have dealt with as well. So I completely understand where this is coming from and how important it is to prevent burnout. One thing that I think is super, super important with all of this, which I'll get into later, is this is not about blame. It's not about anything wrong with you and it's not about anything wrong with the company that you work for. Um, so I don't wanna get into any of feelings of, you know, it's your fault that you're not taking care of yourself. You know, you need to do better self-care to prevent burnout. I don't want to get into that sort of thing. I also don't want to get into, oh, well, you know, the companies don't understand and management doesn't understand and, you know, the higher-ups just don't understand and if they just gave us a better work-life balance, because I really don't think that the blame has any place in it. It's really just a matter of there's a whole big issue and there's not one way of solving it. There's not one way of, uh, one issue at hand. So I've been, um, I've been doing therapy in a variety of capacities since 2006, from inpatient psych to uh, in-home to DCF to uh, substance abuse to, um, what am I doing, uh, private practice as well. And um, I absolutely love doing all of this. So what I want to focus on today is just the... Um, want you guys to have an ability to recognize some of the vicarious trauma symptoms in, in yourself so you know can develop a safety, a safety plan, <laughs> develop a self-care plan to make sure that you can navigate some of the work that you're dealing with without sacrificing yourself. But also, is there anything that you guys are interested in? Is there anything that you want to um, get out of this seminar in particular? We'll just go with it then. All right, so any of you guys that remember or that were in the last group, do you remember what she talked about? What is trauma? What is trauma? Kind of, yeah. Too much too soon. It's really the body failing at a, um, at the body failing at a cellular level to regulate. Trauma is not an experience. Trauma is the body's response to the experience. If, it, if trauma were the experience, then everybody that went through a car accident, everybody that went through war, everybody that went through you know, something that was quote unquote traumatic, would either have PTSD or would not. So trauma is not in fact what happens to us, but it's how we respond to what happens to us. It's our body failing to regulate. Um, the DSM kind of says that it's exposure to a traumatic or stressful event, but that's not necessarily the cases we were just talking about. It's our physical responses, it's our emotional responses. Uh, when we're calm, we're able to think clearly, we're able to respond to situations in a logical manner, but when we are um, activated, it's much more difficult. We're basically in a survival response. Talking about the survival response, we've got the physiology of trauma. So we've got a couple of different things, parts of our body, right? We've got the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is the uh, part of our body that's dominant when we're under stress. Um, it's also that survival part. So what, what happens with the fight flight response, what happens with the high heart rate, um, physical responses within the body, physiological responses in the body, 
whereas the parasympathetic is the calm, the rest and digest, as they also call it. When we're in the sympathetic nervous system dominance, we can't really make sense of events. This is like what uh, the lady, I can't remember her name. Does anyone remember her name? I can't remember her name. What was it? Donna. Donna, thank you. What Donna was talking about in the previous group, that um, when we can't make sense of events, we can't integrate properly when we are in that fight flight stage. So when we're not, when we're in the sympathetic nervous system dominance, memories aren't integrated, behaviors and emotions that are happening in that moment are normal. So if we're throwing things or if we're punching a wall or screaming or crying, we're in the, we're in the para, uh, sympathetic dominance, super, super normal. It may not be appropriate for the situation, but it's normal. It's your body basically saying, hey, we have a problem here. Um, <clears throat> versus the uh, parasympathetic where we're more calm, at peace, able to listen, you know, we're able to do the stomach breathing, we're able to laugh, be mindful. We can't do that if we're in danger. If we're about to die, if we've got this bear like attacking us, we can't think clearly. We can't focus on that. All we're doing is whatever it takes to survive that moment. So there's a huge connection between the brain and the body, right? So we've, we've known it. And the body is basically the stage that, um, what am I saying here? It's a stage that plays out the story in the brain. So whatever is going on in here is being played out in the body. So we've got a couple different parts of the brain that, that respond to um, trauma. The cerebrum is that outermost part of the brain, right? It's got the cortex, it's got all of that good stuff in it. And underneath that, she was talking about, Donna was talking about too, we've got the limbic system. Um, and the limbic system combines the higher mental functions, the primitive emotion into one system. And that really consists of the amygdala, the hippocampus, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the cingular gyrus, the basal ganglia. It really just combines all of those pieces together. And again, similar to what Don was talking about, a lot of uh, trauma therapy, you know, people will do CBT. But the problem with CBT is it's really good at focusing on the cerebrum, but that's not where trauma is stored. Trauma and secondary trauma are also sitting in the limbic system. They're sitting in the body. So we're going to talk about three different parts of the limbic system real quick. Uh, okay, so we got the amygdala. The amygdala is the emotional control part of the brain. It responds to these, the, felt, um, the felt experiences in the body. So if you went to a party, you saw somebody you haven't seen in a while, you get reactive to it, you're like, oh, hi, it's awesome to see you. Right? We feel that in the body. The, bo the brain is remembering something and is saying, hey, good memory, good feelings. If it's somebody that you saw that you really didn't like, then the memories are going to be, ah, bad memory, ick, stay away from that person. You know, so it's going to have a whole different response. But the, um, that limbic system is the part that's, that's uh, in control of all of that. Oh. So the problem with the fight-flight response is that it's pretty automatic. It's, as she was talking about too, it's so deep down in the brain, it's not something that we necessarily have control over, right? So I jump to a scary movie because I don't know that it's in a movie. My amygdala is basically saying, hey, danger, bad, not good, and I'm jumping to the scary movie at the same time I'm laughing, saying that's pretty funny, I didn't need to, to jump to that. But my amygdala doesn't know that. So even though there's no danger, the amygdala is responding anyway. So. If we realize we're not in danger, what happens? We're already flooded with the amygdala, we're already flooded with the adrenaline. It's not as easy to just calm down. We might still be a little shaky, even though we know everything's okay. And then we have the hippocampus. The hippocampus, I keep wanting to say hiccups. The hippocampus is the part of our brain that stores our memories. So it allow, allows us to respond to danger. If, we, if something comes into, if we have an experience, and that experience hits the hippocampus, it's either going to say, hey, okay, not okay, uh, based on my memories. It's going to then um, allow us to respond to the danger if there is a danger. As memories are stored not just as the event, but also all of our sensory details, all of that is going to occur in, or trigger in the hippocampus as well. 
So whenever we see something like I just talked about the movie, if I jump to a scary movie, if somebody, uh, war vets might uh, jump to a car backfiring, it's not necessarily just about what is happening right here, right now. The car backfiring may not have a big deal to anything, but it's the sound that reminds them of something else. So it's, it, our memories are stored also as very sensory. And then we have the sensory thalamus. And the sensory thalamus is kind of like this information gateway in the brain. And it basically allows us to communicate with, or the hippocampus to communicate with the other parts of the brain. So we have, what happens is this, the information comes in and then basically the sensory thalamus says, let's send this out along to the amygdala, but it also sends it along to the cortex. The amygdala is like the super highway, fight or flight, immediately, before we even realize that there's a problem, uh, or not a problem. Whereas the cortex is more of the winding road through the back hills, not that we have hills here in Florida, but hey, you know, through the winding back hills, eventually getting to, eh, there's no danger here. This is what's going on right here, right now. You're just remembering a past event. Everything's okay. But because the survival response is so important to us, because we're basically, it's a split second between life and death, we need the amygdala to respond first before we can actually say, okay, I am okay or not okay. So we want that. We want to be able to be reactive to this um, potential threat before we realize if it really is a threat or not. So in essence, basically what's happening here is we're gonna pull it all together, right? We've got this experience. I see the whole room. I've got this experience and my hippocampus is gonna say, hey, did I, have I done this before? If it was a good experience, cool. If it was a bad experience, I'm gonna be kind of anxious about it. I'm gonna be kind of nervous about it. And if, the, if it was a bad experience, now this uh, memory is coming back to mind from, I see this, and I say, okay, um, hippocampus remembers this, danger, this is bad, amygdala goes off, sends the adrenaline into the body, fight or flight, second signal goes to the cortex, basically says, this is a different conference. You're in a different place, you're in a different place, town, you're in a different whatever, everything's okay, not a big deal. Um, but because you've already reacted to it, it's gonna take time to settle back down in the body. The more that we get reactive to something, where Donna was showing us that um, neural pathways and how the, you, know, you have an experience that kind of gathers with, with the previous experiences and it kind of makes that neural network even bigger and bigger, the more experiences that we have, the harder it is to not become reactive to something. And the harder it is to bring it back down. So if I'm constantly being hit with adrenaline over and over and over, it's hard to um, settle back down. I may not ever go back to a zero before I get hit with the, amygdala, with the um, adrenaline again. There's also two other important components that I want to pay attention to, the vagus nerve or the polyvagal nerve. Do you guys know the polyvagal nerve? Have you heard of polyvagal theory? Yeah. So the polyvagal nerve is uh, pretty much the long, uh, it's really the second longest nerve in the human body. I think I wrote the longest here. But it's, what I understand is you've got the um, spinal nerve or something to that effect, and that's even longer than the uh, vagus nerve. But, so I think it's actually the second longest nerve. But the, the vagus nerve basically goes from the um, brain stem down into the pelvic region in the body, and it basically goes in both directions. Most of our nerves go in one direction. They'll either go from the body to the brain or from the brain to the body. The vagus nerve goes in both directions, which, is kind of makes, it, which makes it kind of neat. Have you ever pinched a nerve in your, in your back or in your neck somewhere and you realize that when you pinch that nerve, you're like, I think it's up here, but in fact it's down here a little bit farther? Same thing happens with the vagus nerve. If we're holding on to tension somewhere in our body, when pinching that nerve, it's not necessarily gonna send out a signal right there. It might send a signal elsewhere. So the vagus nerve is, wraps around different parts of the um, core, the stomach, the spleen, different parts of the body in the core. And if we're pinching the vagus nerve, it's basically going to shut off the digestion. If I'm, if I'm in danger right now, I don't need to digest. I need to save the energy and put the energy elsewhere so that I can then later on, I'll be able to digest, but right now, I need to have that energy elsewhere. So my vagus nerve is basically being pinched, sending the signal to the, di the digestive system, shut down, I don't need you right now, which is why a lot of people that have ongoing traumas have IBS or other gastrointestinal problems as well. So the vagus nerve is a really important part of our body, um, and 
you know, Bessel talks about it, that 80% of the fibers in the vagus nerve run between the body and the brain. That's a huge percentage. 80% of what's going on is, going, is being transmitted between the body and the brain. And then we also have the right and the left hemispheres of the brain, again, which he talked about a little bit, right? So the left hemisphere is that le analytical part of the brain. The left hemisphere uh, has the logic, has the, um, I just drew a blank on the word, um, the part of the brain that, that has speech. And I just drew a blank on that part of the word. But uh, did I write it down anywhere? Nope, I didn't. OK. Um, but whatever that speech part of the brain is that right now I'm drawing a blank on the name of, that's all in the left hemisphere of the brain. So when that left hemisphere goes offline with trauma, huh? Broca's, yeah, Broca's, thank you. Um, Broca's area. So when that left hemisphere goes offline, we can't talk. And we have a hard time explaining. We have a hard time saying what's happening. You know, so when, when somebody says, what just happened? You're like, I, 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 I don't even know, right? Like, it's very hard to have that part of the brain um, work because it doesn't need to right now. It's all emotion that's on. So when we're dealing with trauma, when we're dealing with traumatic memories, that left brain goes offline. Logic is, is out the window. It's not there. So we have to control, um, we have control of the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is more of that emotion based. Okay. So when we're dealing with, what I wanted to go here first is just kind of understanding the physiology of trauma before getting into compassion, fatigue, burnout, um, secondary traumatic stress. Because this is all the foundation for where secondary traumatic stress, compassion, fatigue, and burnout come from. Our experiences, and I'm gonna get into this in a minute, but our experiences aren't just our experiences, but they are learned and are witnessed experiences. They're the things that we see in television, the things that we see in the news, the things that we see or hear from other people, the things that we um, see in movies that aren't even real. Um, but our brain is taking all of these experiences in and doesn't know the difference, my story, your story. So when we're, again, I'll get to this in a minute, but when it comes to compassion fatigue, you know, we don't know, the brain doesn't know the difference, my story and your story. I'm hearing people's stories all day long. My brain is saying, hey, I'm in danger all day long. So I wanted to go over the physiology of trauma because whether it's compassion fatigue, stress, uh, secondary traumatic stress, burnout, or trauma itself, like a primary trauma, the same thing happens in the brain. All right, so this is a very short little video here, if I can make this thing work, because I haven't tried this. Well, I've, I've tried it in other places, but not here. So let's just make sure this will work. Do not buy solar panels. If you live in yeah, one yeah, of these yeah. 11 states of America, How do I skip the it's the worst decision you could make for you. Hey, where's my sound? Just of mine, just um, helping care providers take care of Thank ourselves. You. Instead of saying, I can give no more, we just continue to give. Hey! With all the things that I've How experienced you guys can't see between it? myself or coworkers Thank and you. realize, wow, that's what ca uh, compassion fatigue is. I think what people end up... Do you guys know how to make the video work? No? <laughs> oh, is that what I have to do? I'm sorry. Let's see. I I'm think I'm out of presentation mode, so. Is, no, uh, that's not working either. All right, we're gonna do it this way, where you guys get to listen to it. Um, they internalize it. I think it's our culture to, um, to feel like we need to be tough. You have to get through your shift, you have to get everyone else through the shift. So a lot of times you'll take whatever emotional turmoil you went through and stuff it down and pretend you'll deal with it later. I can think of many instances where I paused at the door and said, can I think of an excuse not to go into this room? But there's, you, that's not what this job is and that's not really what we wanna do. So you go into the rooms and you try to do the best that you can do. And I think those people that need it the most are probably the least inclined to stop and say, I need help, this is hard. 
there's always, you know, the first death you ever experience. I can still remember, you know, pulling a bread out of this little girl's hair. It's those moments that put the humanness into it, because you think, we had done everything we could as a team to save this little life. And as we were cleaning her up to get her ready for her family to come see her, I find this barrette in her hair and I think, oh my gosh, somebody put that in her hair. That was her mom. Like, I'm sure when she did that, she did not think that would be the last time she ever got to do that. So that was 14 years ago. I have a heavy heart. I carry it with me, I think about it, I think about it when I'm going to bed at night. I would never want to give that moment up. I think it um, helps turn you from a task-oriented provider to really focusing, when you can, to the humanness of it. It's heartbreaking because I have two children, you know, um, boys who are six and seven years old, and it's very easy to quickly put yourself in the place of this parent and what they're going through. It's a difficult balance because you want to feel enough emotion and empathy and compassion and connect with what's going on with patients and their families, but not have it be so overwhelming that you can't do your job. You know you're going into a room that there's either anger or pain or some sort of suffering um, that you don't know how to help with. And it, you do pause before you go into the room and say, can I because you want to make a difference. And can I make a difference in this room? And you can't always make the difference that you want to make. We see everything. It's hard to even communicate that at home to your spouse because they just don't understand what you deal with. There's always an emotional attachment to wanting people to be better. And we spend so much effort taking care of the patient and taking care of the patient's family, but we have very little time to take care of ourselves. There is a limit to the amount of care you can give somebody else unless you take care of yourself fully first. You're not validating what you did as a profession, which is amazing. We do amazing work. All right, so I apologize. I couldn't figure out how to make that work for you. But what are your experiences, or what are your thoughts about that video, even though it was really more of an audio? <laughs> Sorry about that. But what are your thoughts about that? What caught your attention? I'll share. Go for it. Yeah, we really are. We really are. We take care of other people and like, I'm okay. Everything's okay. I can handle this. This is what I do. I also noticed when I listened to that video, or watched that video that first time, one of the things that I noticed was just being able to see as she was talking about taking the barrette out of the child's hair. You know, I can visualize her taking that barrette out of the child's hair. So that's what we do, right? We visualize what our clients are telling us. We visualize our, this, their stories. Uh, it's not just, we, we don't just hear it. We actually see what they're telling us. Um, so. As I was just talking a minute ago, client stories become our stories. So it's very difficult for the brain to distinguish between the two of them. So we look into vicarious trauma now. How do we get vicarious trauma? How do we get compassion fatigue? How does, how does this happen in the brain? Other than hearing, our, hearing stories becomes our stories. How do we hear this? How does it become compassion fatigue? Yeah, exactly, a trauma response, right? Our, our um, sympathetic nervous system activates. Our sympathetic nervous system is activating and we have a feeling of empathy. That feeling of empathy where we're connected to that other person, that person that's telling us that story is what creates that secondary traumatic stress, that, that compassion fatigue. If I'm empathizing with you and feeling your story, then I'm gonna start to have, potentially have that compassion fatigue. Um, and then secondary traumatic stress is really where um, we hear it over and over and over. If we're doing the sympathetic nervous system activation along with that empathy over and over and over, for us that's where we develop the secondary traumatic stress. We're visualizing with them. Okay. So. As I was saying a minute ago, the, the brain does not know the difference between real and perceived danger. Past, present, and future, 
emotional and physical danger. It just, the amygdala is a smoke detector. Are you burning the house down or are you burning the hot dogs? It doesn't know, it goes off. So what happens with the um, compassion fatigue, the secondary traumatic stress, is the amygdala is potentially reacting over and over and over to this perceived danger. It's not able to distinguish. So I don't know how many times have you noticed holding your breath, clenching your jaw or, in your mu or clenching your muscles, or even just zoning out for a moment with your clients. Yeah. As you're doing that, as you're clenching those muscles or zoning out just a minute or um, feeling a little bit, holding, holding your chest tight, all of those things are basically your sympathetic nervous system activating. And when that's happening, client after client after client after client, we're training the brain that something's bad. We're training the brain that something's not good, that this is not going to be safe for us. And over a period of time, that can become a problem. That can become compassion fatigue. I can't do this job anymore. I, I, I can't keep going to work and hearing this. Um, or it can become more of that irrit irritability and stress and apathy and I'm just I don't care about these people anymore. I'm done. You know, they don't care about taking care of themselves. They don't care about you know, doing things that are right for them. I, I can't do it anymore. So we end up with that defensive me defense mechanism to protect ourselves. I can't do it anymore. So what I want, to, want you guys to think about is that many, in the past, many people were basically told, and I know this is something that I was told too, is we don't talk about ourselves at all. Therapy is not about us. When we are the therapist, it's not about us. We do not share about ourselves. We just have this, you know, basically this wall to be able to say, you tell me your story, I will hold it, I will be okay, I will um, not empathize with you and all of that so you can feel free to share. One of the problems though is we're human. We're going to feel, and I do think that Many people today are not looking for that type of therapist anymore. They're not looking for that type of therapist that's just going to sit there and go, mm-hmm, and how do you feel about that? <laughs> right? Um, so there is this balance. I mean, you don't necessarily share about yourself. Yes, there is this balance. We do have that, the boundaries that we have to hold. But at the same time, having the humanist, humanistic part of us to be able to show that we are still human, that is a new paradigm that we're starting to shift into a little bit as therapists. It is important to make sure you're holding your boundaries with that. It's hugely important. It is not um, a weakness. It is not shameful to feel sad, to feel um, effects of the work that you do. You should feel the work effects of the work that you do to some degree because you are human as well and you are feeling what these people are also feeling. So it is important for us to not um, minimize what we are feeling within ourselves as well. So I think one of the things I think is really important here is why are words so important? We've got compassion fatigue, we've got burnout, we've got you know, traumatic stress, we've got PTSD. Why are words so important? Validating. Validating, yeah. Also, I think another one too is stigma. You know, when if if we are dealing with, you know, like PTSD is in the is in the DSM. Compassion fatigue isn't. Secondary traumatic stress isn't. But physiologically, what's happening in both cases? Physiologically, it's the same stuff going on, right? But there's this piece of it that just isn't isn't the same. So the vocabulary is important. It validates people, it validates their experiences, and it also helps to destigmatize what's happening. Uh, compassion, satisfaction are the positive aspects of helping. Um, okay, com uh, compassion, satisfaction are the positive aspects of helping. Compassion fatigue is obviously the negative. Burnout is the ineff feeling ineffective, feeling overwhelmed. And then we've got the work-related traumatic stress, which basically you've got two pieces to. That primary traumatic stress, which is direct target of an event. So if something happened at work, if there was an event that happened at your work, if, um, I don't know, anything happened to one of your clients or one of your uh, coworkers' clients, 
anything happen to you while you were at work, but also that secondary traumatic stress, which is the um, you hearing it from somebody else. I'm skipping that one. All right, so we've got the uh, compassion satisfaction, compassion fatigue. Have you guys seen this? Most of you probably have by now. But the uh, professional uh, quality of life scale. Professional quality of life scale is um, pretty good when it thinks that when you think about it from a work perspective, but it's also pretty good when you think about it from a life perspective. It's not just about work. This uh, vicarious trauma model is really good at managing what's going on at home as well. Uh, so compassion fatigue and second tra traumatic stress, I was saying they're not diagnoses, um, but they are things that can be identified in the PQOL scale. So compassion satisfaction. Tell me a little bit about when you're feeling this compassion satisfaction, when you're feeling good at work, what does that feel like? Awesome, awesome, right? You're feeling motivated, you're feeling engaged, you're feeling part of the team, part of what you're doing, you feel like you're, this is more of a thought, not a feeling, but you feel like you're doing right by other people, right? And that can be due to the, per the care you provide. It can also be due to the system that you're part of, the agency, you know, that sort of thing. Your colleagues, your beliefs about yourself and al altruism. Uh, is there anything that, that you have in your agency or if you work private practice, is there anything that you do, any people that you communicate with that creates that compassion satisfaction for you? Yeah, you guys do have some. Good. So what is, it, what is it like to work with other people that also have that? If you have this compassion satisfaction and other people do too, how do you notice that in them? When, what's that like for them? feels good. It's exciting. You like going to work. Yeah, absolutely. On the other, scale, on the other um, side of the scale is the compassion fatigue, which is really the um, negative aspects. Very similar, right? You know, the, the, they're related to the care that we provide, to the system that we work with, to the colleagues that we work with, to our beliefs about ourselves, right? All of the, the, re the aspects are going to be the same. It's just how are they playing out in our daily life? or in our daily work. And if, we have a, if we're more unhappy on the, the professional quality of life scale, the higher we are on that, the higher our risk of the compassion fatigue. So a lot of times when people start to develop the compassion fatigue, what are some of the things that you might notice? What are some of the symptoms or, or feelings or beliefs or attitudes that people, or behaviors that people might um, display? Yeah, more sick days. Isolation. Isolation. Indifference. Indifference. Grumpy. Grumpy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not good to go to work with, like, with people like that, right? When people are feeling indifferent, when they're feeling grumpy, when they're feeling you know, w withdrawn from what they're doing, it doesn't feel good to go to work with them. What was it? Procrastination. Procrastination. Yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to hold off on that. You know, it's funny, procrastination... Um, is actually a good thing and a bad thing. Procrastination is actually something that can, that can be a benefit to ourselves. When we think about procrastination in a way of, I'm not gonna do this just yet, I'm gonna think about it, I'm gonna hold off on it, I can actually say, okay, wait, maybe that was a bad idea, let me not do that. Like if we, if we put 15 things in our Amazon basket, and they were like, oh, well, let me procrastinate on buying those for a minute. <laughs> right? It, procrastination can be a good thing. <laughs> but procrastination can also be a bad thing when it causes too much stress and then we're way behind on our notes and then we don't feel good about ourselves. All right, and then, and then we have secondary traumatic stress. Secondary traumatic stress and burnout are very, very similar, but they're not exactly the same. The chronic exposure to, to, to traumatic, secondary traumatic stress is going to cause the fear. The chronic exposure is going to cause the sympathetic nervous system to activate over and over and over. And when we're tired, when we're drained, when we haven't gotten enough sleep, when we're just you know, processing things over and over and over, our clients over and over and over in our brain, we're more likely to, um, more, more at risk of developing secondary traumatic stress 
because they're already activated. You know, I was talking a minute ago about the fight flight response, right? So when we're hungry, the uh, sympathetic nervous system activates, right? When you're really hungry, what happens? What do you notice physiologically? Yeah, <laughs> you shake, right? Your heart rate may go up, you're not thinking as clearly, right? All of these things that are the same as uh, the fight flight response. And why are we doing that? Go all the way back to cavemen days, I need to survive long enough to find food. So my brain is giving my body this energy to be able to, uh, find, to be able to stay active long enough to find food. At a certain point in time, my body is going to say, oh, wait a minute, this isn't working, conserve energy, and it's going to shut down. But at the beginning, it's basically the survival response. So if we're hungry, and we didn't eat breakfast, and now we're going off to work, we're already setting ourselves up for that secondary traumatic stress, because we're already activating that um, sympathetic nervous system. Burnout is more the feelings of inadequacy, hopelessness. And it's, it's, it can be some, some, yeah, can be some systemic issues there as well, it's, and it's pretty gradual. Burnout is not generally something that happens right away. Burnout is something that happens over a period of time. So they both share that negative effect of being worn out, but one is worn out, more worn out versus one being more afraid. That secondary traumatic stress is my um, amygdala is going off. Secondary traumatic stress is I'm hearing your stories over and over and over and over, and I'm getting reactive to that. Versus burnout being, I'm apathetic, I'm done, I can't handle this anymore. So I'm worn out. All right. So basically what we're looking at here is the symptoms are going to be very, very similar. The, sim the symptoms of vicarious trauma, the symptoms of burnout, the symptoms of... Um, Compassion fatigue are going to be very, very similar. And you can feel them at work. You can feel them at home. You know, it doesn't turn, like Donna was saying in the previous group with trauma, right? It doesn't just turn off when the, th when the client leaves your office. Same thing, it doesn't just turn off when you decide it's work day's over. It's 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, whatever time you're done with your job. Turn it off. Done. Brain can now go to sleep. It doesn't work that way. So... You can have these symptoms whether you're at home or at work. You might find the avoidance symptoms at home. You might find that you're no longer hanging out with your family as much. You might find that you're drinking a little bit more. You might find that you're going to the gym a little bit more. But you're doing something that's not necessarily who you were before as a way to try and cope with this. Compassion fatigue, um, we're really avoiding things that we enjoy. It's more of that avoidance. It's not good to work with somebody like that. When somebody's feeling that compassion fatigue, it just does not feel good to work with somebody like that. It kind of drains that morale. And burnout, there's a couple of definitions here of burnout. Burnout is a psychological sy sy syndrome of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced personal accomplishment. And the other uh, definition, the chronic conditions of perceived demands outweighing perceived resources. I don't like that one. I like that one a lot. The chronic condition of perceived demands outweighing perceived resources. So we've got those perceived threat increases is really a stress response, and then we have that anxiety. We're responding to that. And we, we, I, I think we also saw this a lot with, um, not just with what we were doing here, but think about what happened with COVID. Think about what happened with even people that weren't in our field. Think about people that, um, grocery store workers, you know, people that were essential workers that all of a sudden have to now be thrown into the community to stay, to, to keep things open for people when they're like, I don't know what's going on here. I, you know, very early on in the pandemic, no one really understood it enough that everyone was terrified to go out. And yet people who are not trained in anything like this, not understanding any of it, are thrown into, you have to go to work and deal with people. So the um, chronic conditions of perceived demands outweighing perceived resources, do these people have the resources it takes to be able to be okay in that environment? So I like that definition of burnout because a lot of people were, were burning out in COVID. 
right? Not just our field, but a lot of people were getting burnt out during COVID. And then there's other factors to burnout too, right? Like burnout is not just the internal factors, but we've got our work environment. What's expected versus what's reasonable, and that doesn't always match. Um, and also how that's handled by coworkers, management, CEO. The culture of the workplace. Do you guys support each other? Are you guys actually a team? What is the language and the attitude of the workers there? And do you feel valued? If you answer no to a lot of this stuff, it can increase the risk of burnout. And then we've got those other life stressors as well. Anything that's going on with family, your work-life balance, and then other personal stressors as well. Remember, it's all of this stuff that's combined. It's not just one thing. This is going to happen because compassion fatigue burnout happens not just because of what's happening at work. It's this consistent um, adrenaline rush because of that perceived danger over and over and over and over. It doesn't matter if that perceived danger is at home or that perceived danger is at work. If it's going off over and over and over, we're increasing our risk. Um, I want to skip ahead and I'm going to come right back. Let's see. La, la, la. Because I should have. Oh, wait. No, wait. I lied. Don't, don't worry about me. <laughs> I, I, I meant to um, update this and put one of the slides where it needed to be. And that was the one that it needed to be, was that, that slide. So I want you to think about whether your values, ethics, and morals um, match the company's values, ethics, and morals. When you're thinking about, you know, when you went to work um, for a company, you might have said the vision of this place, the mission of this place aligns with me. Five years later, does it still? Because it's something that is constantly evolving. You know, companies are constantly evolving and their structure is constantly changing. If your values no longer match the values of the company, you're uh, setting yourself up for higher risk of burnout. But it's not a problem with the company. It's not a problem with you. You know, values should shift. Um, companies should change, change up their mission. It should be a living thing. And if we don't take that into account, what it's like, oh, is they don't care about us. Well, not necessarily. They should be changing. So just paying attention to um, whether your values, ethics, and morals match the, the company's values, ethics, and morals. All right. So coming back to the professional QOL real quick, this is in your packet if you, you know, online on that little app that we have. You can, you can find this. You can also find it online. It's free. It's easy. It's a 30-item 30, 30 self-report, and it's going to have two subscales, both a burnout and a secondary trauma. Um, So I do highly recommend using that. All right, so what do you do when you notice yourself getting activated with a client? Or what could you do? If you're getting reactive, if you're holding your breath or tensing your muscles a little bit, clenching your jaw, breathe, breathe right? Self-regulation, the stuff that we teach our clients. We should be doing that as well. In every session, we should be modeling that with, for our clients. To be able to turn off that uh, fight-flight response, we have to turn on the left side of the brain, turn off the right side, right? So what we want to do is we want to decrease the sympathetic nervous system activation. We want to increase the parasympathetic dominance. And we do that through those self-regulations, first and primary. So we can breathe, when somebody's suffering, we can breathe with them. And if we're doing that, we're not only helping them to self-regulate, we're not only modeling it to them, but we're also doing it for ourselves. So it's an incredibly beneficial thing to do. Involve the body. Again, one of those things that Donna was talking about is uh, trauma is not just stored in the brain, right? So we need to be able to involve the body, relax the body. The body stores a great deal of stress. She had up there, I don't remember if she actually said it out loud, but I think she did. But she talked about the book, um, The Body Keeps the Score, by Bessel van der, Kolk, van der Kolk. The great book, I also highly recommend it. But basically what he's saying is this book, it, uh, the body holds on to all of the stuff that we deal with every single day. We're getting that check mark, check mark, check mark every time that we're activating. 
So what we want to do is we want to involve the body, relax the body, release the body. Yoga is great, Tai Chi is great, anything that involves the body. There's a lot of research that really shows that connection there and how beneficial that is. So, by, um, okay. so what is the difference between self-regulation and relaxation? Kind of similar, right? A little bit different, though. So self-regulation are things that you're going to be able to do in the moment. They're, not things, they're things that are going to not take you out of your daily routine. So you can, if you're sitting with a client, you can do a deep breath, and they won't even know. You know, you can do um, a tense and release, and they won't even know. So you can do those things 200 times throughout the day, and no one's going to know. Whereas relaxation is something that is done when you have a little bit more time. The meditations and things like that, yogas, things like that. They're going to take you out of your daily routine. So what we want to do is we want to be able to do both. When we're doing the self-regulation, we're cutting off the brain, we're cutting off the signal to the amygdala saying we're in danger right now, over and over and over. We're cutting it off. Don't send me the adrenaline, I don't need it. So if I'm doing the breathing techniques, I'm not trying to calm my body down. If I'm doing the breathing techniques, I'm trying to tell my brain, hey, right here, right now, I'm safe. I don't need any more adrenaline. I've already got more than I need. Don't send me any more. What it's not doing is it's not gonna calm me down because adrenaline is a chemical. And the only thing that takes the chemical out of your system is time got to reabsorb back into your system. So as we're doing the self-regulation 100,000 times a day, we're interrupting that process. I don't need it, I don't need it, I don't need it, I don't need it. Great thing to do. But the more we keep ourselves in that state, the more we're retraining our whole system. Not just turning it off, but we're retraining our whole system. If you can't sit with meditation for 15 minutes, don't. Start with a minute, work your way up. Get out of your comfort zone a little bit, but don't get out of your comfort zone so much that you're never going to do it. So if you can do 15 push-ups, do 20, but don't do 50, right? Same thing. Get out of your comfort zone a little bit, but don't go too far. So if you can't do 30 minutes and 15 minutes of meditation, great, no problem. Start small. If you can't do it at all, meditation is not just about sitting in silence. Meditation can be done walking. You know, meditation can be done listening to music. Meditation can be done listening to guided meditations, guided um, techniques. So there's a whole, whole lot of different techniques that we can do that will take us, take the sympathetic nervous system down and increase the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. What are some of the other self-regulation tools, the things that are, aren't going to take you very long? So you got the breathing techniques, you got the muscle relaxation, anything else? Cooling your body down? Oh, it's ice. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Has anyone done the wet noodle? Blah. <laughs> right? Blah. <laughs> so the wet noodle is another one that can be very helpful. The DBT half smile. The DBT half smile. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, has anyone, so I, I went to a training once on... Um, I can't remember what exactly it was on, but something on trauma. And they talked about the peripheral vision. So this one's kind of weird, but it's really kind of cool at the same time. And when I did this in the training, I thought that it was absolutely amazing because I'm sitting with you where you guys are, so why do I have to be stressed out? But when I did this, I'm like, oh, that actually worked. I feel better. But basically, if you stick your hands out in front of you and slowly open your fingers, don't do it quickly, and continue to look in front of you. Don't look at your fingers. See your fingers in your peripheral vision. And as you're doing that, you're opening up the um, peripheral vision. It's kind of like opening up the curtains. And it kind of it calms you down. So you may not be able to do that um, right away, but it's something that you might be able to if you have a moment to go to the bathroom. right? You're not doing a 15-minute meditation, but it's a quick, easy. I had a client of mine once that, that, that did this. I taught, taught it to her. And she, um, she was a clerk in a, a court court in the court system. Um, and so she, she basically, there were like four of them in there. And she told them, she did this once, and then she told, so they said, what are you doing? Her coworker's like, what are you doing? And she actually told them. She said, this is something I learned in therapy, and it really works. So they actually, all four, started doing it. 
and found it really effective that they got a keyword that if any one of them was then stressed out, they would say that keyword, and then everyone had to stop whatever it was they were doing, do the peripheral vision, okay, get back to work. So to each their own. If that works with you guys and you want to kind of bring it to the office, bring it to the office. Also the pelvic floor relaxation, right? So basically it's the opposite of a Kegel, but you're, rele <laughs> you're releasing the muscles in the pelvic floor. Because you're rele from that, you're, you're releasing the tension on the, on the um, polyvagal nerve. So you're turning the, allowing the whole system to calm back down. So that's a really nice one. The butterfly hug, okay, this is really hard now, but the butterfly hug is just slow taps. This is an EMDR technique, but it's just slow taps on, on your shoulders. Right hand on left, left on right. Um, and it's just a bilateral calming sensation. So there's a lot of things that are very quick in the moment. Um, here's a whole bunch of them. And then relaxation are things that are going to take you out of your day. So they can be the progressive muscle relaxation. Start at your head, start at your toes, doesn't matter. You don't just go up and down. Sometimes finding a calm place or a safe place can be really hard for you or for your, especially for your clients, especially if they have trauma. Uh, so it might be, it doesn't have to be a real place. It can be something that's found in a book. It can be something that's found in a movie. Um, what we're trying to activate is the calm side of the body. We're trying to calm everything down. So if, I'm, if I ask you to, to visualize a beach, you can probably visualize the beach. And then if I say, okay, what do you hear, what do you smell, all that stuff, you can probably bring it up a little bit. That's what we're trying to do. So if we can do that um, with our clients, but it's not a real place, maybe it's, I don't know, I have nothing idea, uh, Narnia? Sure, why not? <laughs> First thing that came to mind, don't ask me why. But I don't even know. But, um, so if Narnia is their place, then Narnia is their place. All we want to do is activate the calm feelings. It doesn't have to be real. Container basically is where we bring things back into um, a container. I can't deal with this right here, right now. It's not stuffing because I'm going to pull it back out. But I'm at work right now. I can't do this right here, right now. I need to put it away to be able to do it uh, later, to be able to take care of it later on. The container exercise for me, people are like, it, it, the way that I finally found it work for me is my container has to be clear. If my container is not clear, it's just constantly coming back into my head. But with my container being clear, I'm able to then say, okay, I see you there, but I'll get back to you. When it was a dark container, it would just keep popping back out. So whatever works for you, whatever works for your clients. Um, all of this stuff is in, in your packet as well. I have a whole bunch of self-regulation and relaxation techniques in your packet as well. So resiliency. How do, you just, how do you describe resiliency? How do you know that you're resilient? Shake it off. <laughs> so one definition is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. And then the ability for a substance or an object to spring back into shape. That's what the Oxford Dictionary says uh, re resiliency is. Tracy, I went to one of her trainings once, and I really liked her definition. Her definition is when we combine relaxation with what we do. So we're witnessing the trauma, we're hearing our clients' stories, and we're pairing that with our own self-regulation, with our own calming. That is what resiliency is. When we're able to basically say, I can do this, I'm okay here and now. I'm not, al I'm not um, allowing this to take, take charge of who I am. Also, it's important to, relaxation is important, but it's also important to build and maintain relationships. It's important to share our narratives. I know Donna was talking about venting. It's important to allow, to share our narratives, to vent. We need to be able to process it. We need to be able to get it out of ourselves. Uh, it, but when we're processing it, we're making, we're helping ourselves make sense of it, and we're storing it more as a memory instead of traumatic. Um, supervision, inspiration, all of these things help us to find meaning in an event. So that, that's part of resiliency as well. So basically, staying healthy, 
and however it is that you stay healthy. Relaxation, build relationships, and share those narratives. So in your packet, I've got this resiliency plan, and I want you to take a look at that. I want you to take a look at what some of your self-regulation skills are, who are your supports, which supports will allow you to confront you on your symptoms, how you'll validate yourself for the work that you do, and what the self-care activities that you're going to pr participate in are. So that's, that, that's in your packet. But let's just say that you already have some burnout. This is also in your packet. All right? Stalling burnout if it's already started. If, you, if you're already feeling burnt out, you're not alone with that. You're not doomed. But there's several strategies that might help. And these strategies are strategies that I go into a lot more detail when I do my really big course, but this is just an overview. Um, but basically, you've got the identification of the root cause. Ask yourself if you're taking care of yourself. Reassess your goals. If you've never heard of the PERMA model, I like the PERMA model. It's the PERMA model of happiness. Um, it's a really helpful model to kind of go through and think about different aspects of what you're doing um, in your daily life. Being able to learn to say no, practicing positive thinking, finding ways to make your job fun, <laughs> challenge your thoughts about being stuck. If you're not happy, how can you challenge your thoughts around not being happy? Know what motivates you and what depletes you, and then definitely, definitely get to your body, get to your emotions. Don't just, not just your thoughts. It's got to be the right brain as well. We cannot heal trauma in the left brain alone, which means we cannot heal secondary trauma, burnout, compassion fatigue in the left brain alone either. All right, so I mean, that's pretty much what I have here. So basically, you know, when you're not, um, okay, so basically, when, when you're doing all this stuff, when your self care is not enough, you know, then it might be um, and next thing, you, what am I saying here? So self-care is important. Don't want to sacrifice yourself, but balance the self-care. Balance to me is more like a um, surfing, even though I've never surfed. Balance to me is more like surfing in that if I keep a rigid body and I don't allow my knees to bend and I don't allow my core to go with anything, then I'm probably going to fall off the board. But if I allow myself to go with the waves and allow my knees to go with it, then I'm more likely to stay up. So balance is not about all or nothing. Balance is about going with the flow. If you're going to be more uh, active in one week, if you have family in town, if you have whatever, then balancing is, uh, your self-care is going to look different that week than it will other weeks. Listen to others. A lot of times others will see things in us before we see them in ourselves. It's very easy to say, I'm tired. It's very easy to say, well, you know, I just didn't eat, didn't eat breakfast this morning. But listen to other people. And then also listen to yourself. If, this, uh, if you need to take the time for yourself, there is nothing wrong with that. It's incredibly important to do that. We have to be able to give service without sacrificing ourselves. But if all of that's not enough, you know, if family are still saying you're acting differently, if you're still not sleeping well, if you're still more irritable, if you're still not engaging in activities that you enjoy, or you're having these behavior changes like drinking more avoidance, if you're still dealing with all of this stuff, it's time to get some help. It's time to do what you guys do every day. Go to therapy. You know, talk to a coach. You know, do something that's going to help you to regain who you are. All right. So that's pretty much what I have. Do you guys have any questions? The PowerPoint's not in there? Oh, it is there? OK. Huh? Thought it was. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much.